It's great to have with us Tony Romo in this series quarterback. The man needs no introduction. He's the man of the hour, too sweet to be sour, the tower of <laughs> cowboy power. You know where I got that line from? Professional wrestler Dusty Rhodes. Dusty remember Rhodes, him? I do. I remember I grew up watching Hulk Hogan. I oh, yeah. WrestleMania three. Yes. I think that's Pontiac Silverdome, but I don't know much about it. I love, you know what, Tony? I love wrestling. I like the old school better than, I mean, I don't know as much about the new school, I'm but the old what? school. Yeah, I would say I went to about WrestleMania 7-ish. I can remember 6, we had the Ultimate Warrior and Hulk Hogan, and then, yes. then I started to fade after that a yeah. little bit. So. Yeah. But those guys are great athletes. What they do, I mean, they, they're like football players who have to get up on a rope and jump sometimes. Yeah, so. yeah. it's, it's crazy. crazy. Well, Tony, you quarterback America's team. Talk to me about leadership. When I, when I say that word, what, what comes to mind? Well, I think there's a few things. I think, one, um, I felt like... There are many forms of leadership that we all have. I think ultimately you have to be yourself. But uh, the one thing that everyone looks to since I've been in the NFL at any point is someone who does it the right way day in and day out. Mm -hmm. That's probably the number one quality that someone has. And then on top of it, um, your example that you set and, and the approach that you take, people are watching. You know, when you just do something small, it's, it's important. Other people weirdly will not necessarily judge, but they will absolutely be in a position to say, man, I want to be like that. And um, I think that's the number one way you get to be in the position where you're at is just doing things the right way over and over again. So it's sort of, sort of like a life in a fishbowl, life in an aquarium. They're watching when, yeah. you're, when you're a leader. Okay, being a quarterback, Tony, I know you, you've got to be smart as a whip just to think and to do what you do. What is it like? I mean, what's the raw and the real when the game is on the line, you're in the huddle. I mean, how, how do you take charge? Because you have all these incredible athletes and yeah. you're the leader. I mean, how does that happen? I mean, what does that look like? I think when you're young, it, it, I relate it to sometimes when you're a freshman in high school. Uh -huh. It's very hard to take control of that huddle when you have seniors in that group. Um, but as you become that sophomore, junior, and senior, and uh, you become a guy who's been through the experiences a little bit, you have the ability to take the group with you. Everyone wants to be led. Ultimately, we want someone to take control. We all want to be leaders, but at the same time, if somebody has you know, skins on the wall, experiences in the process, yeah. you want them to tell you how to be better. How about play calling? Uh, talk to us about how, how do you guys call a play? Because sometimes I'll hear you say, this is about, my, this is about all I know about football, Omaha, Omaha, whatever. <laughs> and then uh, how does that happen? Does it come like from the, is it from the, called the box? So it's the coach's box, but it's just a similar type thing. Okay. That, a lot of coordinators will be up there and they'll call the play down to someone on the sideline. Uh -huh. On our team, the guy on the sideline calls them into me and they'll come into my head, into the uh, helmet. I'll hear the play. You relay that message to the team. Well, when it comes in, you're changing personnel. So if I give you an example, it'll be, Gosh. we're gonna change personnel. So we're gonna have, we have 11 personnel, uh -huh. which is three wide receivers, one tight end and one running back. Well, all of a sudden it's third and one, we're gonna change and go 13 Z personnel. So I'd say 13 Z, which means now we all of a sudden have one wide receiver, three tight ends, and one running back in the game. So I tell these guys, and right at that moment, the coach is going to call in, let's go I right wing, Z short, oh gosh. 42 ISO, kill, act five, 428, H flat. Now, you want to get this up to the line of scrimmage as fast as you can, mm -hmm. so you can kind of assess what the defense is doing and then attack them where they're vulnerable. And So you're trying to do all these things in, in seconds. Uh, that's amazing. Yeah, it's like anything, though. Once you do it enough times, it gets going. When it first starts off for young guys, it's just, you know, it's, it's tough. But if they commit to their craft, they have a chance to be pretty good. Being a leader, being a quarterback, what are some things you would, you would tell me and tell others who are watching this about dealing with failure? Trying your best and just, you know. Ultimately, how you respond to that mm -hmm. will probably make the difference in your life in a lot of ways. And I think anybody who's lived life long enough understands that you're going to go through the ebb and flow through the seasons of life yes whether it's in marriage whether it's in football whether it's in the workplace friends and i think marriage is probably the most challenging of all those yeah i think you're probably right no seriously yeah i always say all the time marriage is is not the easiest thing it's the hardest thing but it can become the greatest thing if you're willing to work no question i think that's exactly and i'm i was lucky enough to choose you know what i feel like is uh the best wife i've could mm -hmm. have ever you know received or chosen and uh, but you're two sinners, and you're living yeah. together. 
And to think that you're just going to come together That's right. and you're both going to get what you've always had on your own yeah. is just, it's silly. But we think that. And, and then kids come into it. Yes. And then you get to really see sometimes the difficult part of it because we both have to put our respective, I guess you could say, selfish desires yes. off to the side a little bit. Mm -hmm. And in that process, if you have two people who are willing to do that, it's the most beautiful thing and joyful thing. That's right. It's the design. Yes. And then on top of it, it's just having Jesus as the center of it all. That's right. It just makes the design all work. And uh, that's ultimately what I think you want. That's so well said. That's a great sermon. <laughs> this guy can preach too. <laughs> Don't look at me. Tony, how do you deal with haters? Because that, that's one of the things that students tell me all the time, ask me, yeah. Pastor, how do you deal with haters? I mean, you know, social media, with kids, yeah. whatever. And of course, Tony, everyone for the most part loves you, but. <laughs> oh yeah, absolutely. What do you do about that? When I first became the quarterback for the Dallas Cowboys, I had a good run where Everyone wants the backup to play. It's yep. one of those things. And then you go off and you have a little bit of success. Mm -hmm. And in the process of having that success, people were building you up and you get in this position. Like any first pick of the draft kind of gets. Yep. Oh, they're going to do everything perfect and everything's going to yes. be great. And, he's, and then you go through the real life stuff where it's, you're not perfect and you have to figure out a way to, to be the best version of yourself. Well, that was hard for me to like hear people say negative things to me because I was like, I'm a nice guy. And what I found was after about a year or two, I started to recognize like whether they said good or bad things, didn't actually affect my life unless I allowed it to emotionally. They, yeah. they literally, it just when I went to a restaurant and stuff, people were nice. I didn't see any of the person who was saying right. that negative thing on TV or a comment on mm -hmm. the internet. And even if they did, that same person would be really nice to me. And then I was like, someone every once in a while would say something you know, to the bullying or some kids who are young or stuff. I'm like, they just don't matter. Not, right. not to be rude, but they're gonna go away and you're gonna live life and it just, it, it really isn't gonna define you unless you allow it to define mm -hmm. you. It's almost like, I cannot take a picture of you today, Tony Romo, again, one of the best quarterbacks ever, For blah, sure. blah, blah. I cannot take a photo and make my judgment of you there. You know, the contract, the great family, whatever. Yeah. To understand you, I, I gotta go back, you know, whatever, Pee Wee football, you're with your dad playing golf. Yeah. So. I think that's important for people to understand that when, when they do process people that criticize, like, hey, as you said, let it go. I'm not responsible for that yeah. and just move on because you don't really know oh. me. People, people are going to pick on you for, you can be great. Yeah. I saw the best quarterbacks, the best mm -hmm. NBA basketball players, the best golfers, yeah. they're getting picked on. That's right. It's, it's, no one's immune to this mm -hmm. deal. This is life. This is what it's going to be like. And yep. just be like, hey, you know what, blah, 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 Tony Romo, mm -hmm. da, 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 gets picked on, da, da, da. You know what? Everybody does. And so when you know that, it's, it's, it's easier to kind of take. I was literally right here. Mm -hmm. and I was in that room over there in my uh, second year in, in the NFL, and I was at training camp. And it was, in the NFL, you keep three quarterbacks at the most okay. you know, on your football team. And we had went to the playoffs the year before. Mm -hmm. The returning starter's coming back. We brought in an old veteran to challenge him for the starting role. And we brought in a young kid that we traded for who was possibly the future of the franchise. So you have the returning starter, the oh, old gosh. veteran, and then the future guy, and then I'm there too. So the numbers, as you look at it, are very like, hmm, mm -hmm. it's going to be tough. Yeah. So I, I was very stressed and emotional over the first two, three days of camp. And I sat there and I prayed at night. I said, Lord, if I'm meant to be an assistant golf club professional back in Burlington, Wisconsin. Uh -huh. I was like, then I'll be happy and, and enjoy that and be the best version of that that I can be. You know, but I'm done making every single thing be the most important moment of my life. And everything. There's no peace in that. I'm like, I'm giving it to you. That's right. And I literally just said, I'm gonna give you, I'm just gonna go out there tomorrow and I'm gonna throw that ball. I'm, gonna, I'm just gonna say, he's open. I'm yeah. reacting and I'm just gonna let it go and throw it. I'm not gonna worry if I throw it eight yards over his head mm -hmm. or in the dirt, I'm done aiming. And I'm just at peace with whatever happens. But I'm not going down hoping, thinking. I'm going to play aggressively, and I'm just going to leave it up to you and just be at peace with whatever the outcome is. is. And I remember the next day, it was just freeing. It was yep. freeing. I just gave it to the Lord. It was like <laughs> yeah. he all of a sudden had it, and I could just go play. And I had my two or three best practices in the next three days, and the starter ends up getting cut. Wow. Three days later, I end up making a team and then came out from there. But I still relate. That was the moment mm -hmm. where I learned how to play the game because I literally gave it up. He has control. And as long as he has control, I'm at peace. How did you become a follower of Christ, Tony? What, what happened in your life that brought about that decision? Well, I grew up in the church a little bit, you know, Sunday school, but um, I wasn't, I never had known like how to give yourself over mm -hmm. you know, to the Lord. Um, I had never, I guess you could say, never really thought deeper mm -hmm. about it other yeah. than just 
Sunday school was church, and yeah. church was, you know, and Jesus was, you know, Santa in some ways. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, and then I went off to college, and I remember just a few people talking about it. I watched this guy, and he, hey, we got Bible study, mm -hmm. and, blah, and then the way he lived his life, and I see him around. And yeah. Then, and he probably didn't even know, but you're watching, and you're just looking, and you're kind of sensing, and then you're like, you know, I kind of want that. Yeah. And I kind of want that, like the freedom, the peace, mm -hmm. the yes. just the ability to kind of be at ease with when life goes crappy, when it goes good. <laughs> yes. You know, there's peace in mm -hmm. it when someone else, you know, is taking care of you. You're set. That's right. I can just live life and be okay with it. And uh, I'd love to tell you there's this perfect story about how then life from there was like, boom. No, it doesn't work that but way. it doesn't work that way. To think that you're never going to sin again or that you're never going to because you've come to the Lord, or that this, this Christian over here, see, he's fake, he's yeah, a hypocrite. That's right. Yeah, that's right. Well, they don't understand it then. We're all hypocrites. Yes, everyone. Yeah. You know, and I think what you do is you just, whenever you fail or whenever you're mm -hmm. in that, you come back to the Lord. You don't run away from him. That's right. You run to him. That's right. Now, Tony, I drew up a <laughs> play on the way down here. All right. Okay. Here's what it's called, Statue of Liberty. If you do this play, here, here's the deal. I really think this could be the difference in the season. Okay, there's you. Number that nine. Me. All right. And I had to have help drawing this. <laughs> okay, like there's like Dr. Jason, I'm guessing. Yep, there's Whit. And would that be Daz out there? Yep. Okay. You're getting there, I know. Yeah, so what I think. There's Cole, there's Terrence. <laughs> so a running back. They hike the ball to you. That's the way I say it. Yep. Hike it to you, Tony. You go back, Statue of Liberty, okay? They think, what's going to happen? Jason comes around, all right? Takes the ball from you. You go out for a pass, Dez goes out for a pass, and you just fire it downfield. What do you think? And so I hand it to Jason and he throws it back. Yes. Yeah. What do you think? It's a great idea. And if you guys see what he's drawn up here, the problem is Jason's on the right. So if he <laughs> takes the ball and runs left, I know Jason well enough to know he's God. not gonna be physically talented <laughs> no. enough to throw it back right. See? And that would be Gosh. the only problem with statue. Story of my life. Tony, here's something else. Last thing. You stand up for this. Yeah. All right. Back in the day, Tony, I went, I went to, you know, pretty, pretty rugged public schools and stuff and played some sports, whatever. I remember back in the day, people would just give five like that. You give me five. You know, you know old, old school. Oh, yeah, that's how it started. Yeah. And then, you know, the soul handshake and then the, the, the whatever. <laughs> now, what's so funny is now guys are like, you know, hug. You know, we, we all right, what up, we all that, yeah. whatever, and the, blah, blah. Okay. <laughs> Which is cool. It's cool. But I thought about starting something. Okay. It's called the hug illusion. Okay. okay. Here we go. Now, you have a very stressful position. I mean, you're stressed. I mean, it's, you have a lot on you. Yeah. So next time you hug, just watch me. Okay, boom, boom. Just put your head on the guy's shoulder just for a second because it'll give you a brief rest period during the day. Let's just try it. Hug a loose, you ready? Boom, boom, boom. What do you think? Good, I, I like it. I, I, see I thought that was gonna be a stressful moment, but that was actually No, okay. no, it's just no, relaxing. Nice. So nice. Tony, Sorry. you can start this. You have the leadership chops to do Hugolution, and it, it could be it could be crazy. What do you think about it? I like it. I probably would change the name. What would you call it? I was doing it in the locker room. What would you call it? That. The hugs would probably have to change. Okay. What do you call it? What, what is it? Hugolution. Hugolution. But now, now that we hug, maybe it's Tony Bromo. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. I like have, you, it. have you ever been called that? Actually, Tony Bromo. That's there a good go. one. That's there pretty go. good. That's pretty impressive. Tony, listen, man. Seriously, yeah. we're, we're, we're so proud of you. I'm proud of who you are and whose you are. And man, your family, and we uh, pray for you. And man, you keep on doing what you're doing. Yes. All right. <laughs> That's good. <laughs>You decide to play recreation football. You invite your buddies from work and it's a flag football scenario and you played quarterback in junior high. You gather your team together to play the opponent and you're missing one person. So you see someone and you're like, okay, hey man, come over, would you play for us? And it's Tony Romo. And you go, Tony, listen, you just play center, you block for me. You hike me the ball and we'll tell you what to do. So you play, and you have a pretty good game. You, you do well, but you do throw a couple of key interceptions, and your friend drops a touchdown in the end zone. You lose. How crazy is that? You had Tony Romo on your team. One of the best quarterbacks in the NFL, maybe a Hall of Famer, and you played quarterback? You had him 
playing sender and just blocking for you? How, how ludicrous is that? How, how ridiculous is that? Wow. One day Jesus ran into a man, a young man, at the zenith of his life, at the apex of his life. You like this guy. This guy was wealthy. This guy was a leader. He had some serious influence. He came to Jesus at just the right time. He was young. And it's so interesting how the Bible emphasizes young people giving their lives to Jesus. It's great when anyone does, believe me, but, but when someone is young and they acquiesce control to Christ, I mean, the, the, the Bible says we're literally entertaining angels. Angels give us a standing ovation when someone, especially a young person, acquiesces and opens up the lid of their lives and gives it all to Jesus. So this guy runs up to Jesus. He has the right posture. He kneels before him. He's talking to the right guy, the savior of the world, and he begins to ask him some questions. I think one of the most important things that we can do is ask the right people the right questions to get the right answers. And it's so fascinating to see how many people ask Jesus questions. And this is interesting because in this scenario, Mark chapter 10, it's the only time where someone came up to Jesus had a conversation with him, and left in a worse condition. Your heart goes out to this guy. You like this guy. He was a leader. He had a lot of money. Maybe he was a trust safarian. I don't know. Let's pick it up. Trust fund, baby, trust safarian. <laughs> As Jesus started on his way, a man ran up to him and fell on his knees before him. Good teacher. Now let me stop there. Good teacher, good teacher. That sounds like, okay, good teacher. You realize during this context, no one used the word good to describe a teacher unless you were talking to God. The only time good was used was in reference to God. So this young guy drops to his knees comes to Jesus at the right time, and he calls him good. I don't even think he knew what he was saying. And then Jesus, if you could read the original language, is almost saying, do you, do you realize who you're talking to? <laughs> I mean, you're, 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 you're talking to God. So, so he says, good teacher, good teacher, good teacher. And Jesus says, why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. Here's one mistake this guy made. He didn't recognize Christ as Lord. He didn't recognize Jesus as his quarterback. Here's another clueless mistake he made. He didn't understand, he didn't understand performance. He didn't understand his penalties, his wrongdoings. He didn't understand that he was imperfect. He didn't understand the holiness of God. He didn't get it. He thought the salvation was something to be achieved, not something to be received and believed. And it's amazing how many people are in that same boat today, isn't it? Somehow at the end of the day, God will say, you know what, Ed? You fumbled the ball. Yeah, you threw interceptions. You know, you were out of bounds here, out of bounds there. You blew that game, you blew this game, but, but you tried as hard as you could, man. You performed well. Come on into heaven because your good marks outweigh the bad. Sounds sexy, sounds cool, sounds politically correct. The only problem is it's not gonna get us where we need to go. And that's what Jesus is driving at when he talks to this young guy who was quarterbacking his own life. Verse 19, Jesus said, and here's what Jesus says, he throws the Decalogue at him. What's the Decalogue? The Decalogue would be the 10 Commandments. The first five commandments would be God's relationship to man. The second five commandments would be man's relationship to man. Jesus talks about the second aspect of the Decalogue man's relationship to man. This guy thinks 
He's like gonna perform his way into heaven. Jesus said, you know the commandments. You shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not give false testimony, you shall not defraud, honor your father and mother. And here's the thing about the 10 commandments. We don't break the 10 commandments. The 10 commandments break us. And in the New Testament, Jesus took the 10 commandments to an h &L, a whole nother level. Because in the Old Testament, if you commit adultery, you're breaking a commandment. In the New Testament, if you look at someone with lust in your eye, boom, you've committed adultery. In the Old Testament, whack, you kill somebody, you're breaking, you're breaking the commandment. In the New Testament, if you have anger in your heart, you flip someone off in traffic, you've committed murder. Wow, this guy didn't get it. So Jesus is going, hey, so you've kept all these, really? Since maturity, and maturity back in the day was from 12 years of age on? Teacher, he declared, I've kept these since, since I've been a boy. Well, here's something else he didn't get, a third thing, he didn't get grace. So he didn't recognize Christ as Lord. He was clueless about his performance. He didn't get grace. So in verse 21, Jesus looked at him and loved him. I, I love that, don't you? We matter to God. Everyone matters to God. We've never looked at someone, we've never locked eyes with someone who does not matter to God. Jesus looked at him. He saw the potential in him. He saw what he could be. That's what I love about Simon Peter. You remember Simon Peter? This, this guy, we can all identify with him. He's like, Jesus, I got your back, man. I'm a, I, man, I'm with you, I'm with you. And Jesus said, no, 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 you're gonna, you're gonna mess me around. You're gonna deny me. And do you know what he called Simon Peter? He gave him a nickname, The Rock. <laughs> I mean, if you'd have been there, you'd be like, this guy, pathetic. This guy, say one thing, do another. Jesus, you're calling him the rock? Sure enough, what happened? He became the rock, one of the great men of God ever. Jesus loved him. He has a nickname for you. He sees your potential. Yet it all goes back to lordship. Who is running your life and mine? Because remember, Jesus wants the best. So Jesus looked at him and loved him. One thing you lack. And I call this, you can mark this down, the quarterback question. One thing you lack. I mean, he read this guy's email. He hacked into this guy's life. He looked at him, the, the, the Bible says. He said, this one thing you lack, one thing. Now there's a, there's a verse that really, really, really jumps out to me. This one thing you lack. He said, go sell everything. You're like, whoa, you mean? If I truly follow Jesus, if I make Jesus the quarterback of my life, I gotta sell everything? Chill, relax. This is the only time Jesus told someone to liquidate. He met with many people of great wealth, many people who didn't have a thing. This is the only time. What did he see? He saw that this young man was the quarterback of his life. He saw that wealth Cash money was running the show. The Bible calls this a stumbling block. Throughout the New Testament, the, the Greek term scandalon. Say scandalon with me, scandalon. The picture behind scandalon, and if you've ever been to Israel, I have several times, it's, it's, it's a rock that actually grows from the earth. It looks like it's part of the terrain. And as you travel, it would trip up travelers. Scandalon, literally a stumbling block. Jesus looked at him. See, and here's, here's the great thing about Jesus. Jesus didn't just love him superficially. I mean, if it had been superficial love, you know, politically correct love, he'd have been like, man, you know, I love you, and, and you know, uh, everything's cool. Yeah, yeah we're, yeah, we're, yeah, we're cool. All right, rich young ruler, I'll, I'll talk to you later. Jesus, though, does not love us superficially. He loves us completely. And because he loves us completely, he'll have the hard conversations with us. He'll challenge us. That's not parenting, man. Parenting isn't for cowards. 
Parenting, it's not superficial. That's why it's so tough. We gotta get in people's grill. And some of these quarterbacks that I've spoken with, they've told me off the record, hey, I've gotta get in people's grill all the time. If they're one minute late for a meeting, if they miss this route, if they don't hear the signal, or I audibleize, man, I'm, I'm after them. I'm thankful that Jesus tells the truth about our condition. He loves you, he loves me enough to tell us the truth about who we are. So we looked at this guy and he saw the scandal on, the stumbling block. He saw who was quarterbacking his life. Go sell everything, he says, and give it to the poor and you'll have treasure in heaven. And then come and follow me. At this, the man's face fell. Literally, if you could read this in the original language, he, he moved from sunshine to a storm. It, it literally means storm clouds, a, 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 a horrible, horrible situation. If you look at the radar, the radar would look like guacamole <laughs> in this guy's life. So, so his face fell, he took off his helmet, and walk dejectedly off the field. So he made some dumb mistakes. He didn't recognize Christ as Lord, number two. He was clueless about his performance. Number three, he didn't get grace. We're saved by grace through faith. And number four, he bolted, he walked off the field. Now, when I, when I thought about him leaving, you're like, wow, he walked away from Jesus? He walked away worse than when he first met him. Why can I say that? Because he didn't really know the 411 until after Jesus talked to him. So he had the truth, he was talking to the truth, and he decided to walk away. I really wish the guy would have hung out with Jesus. Think about it, even Peter, James, and John, did they really get grace completely? No. Did they really understand lordship? No. Did they really understand making Jesus a quarterback of their life? No. But it's the question that I'm coming back to during this first session. It's the quarterback question. People debate it all the time. People talk about it all the time. You will not go to the Super Bowl unless you have a great quarterback. And if the truth were known, a lot of us are in some funky wildcat setup and it's not working. Jesus is looking at our lives and he's saying, whoa, I see the stumbling block, the scandal on. Who is running your show? Who's taking snaps? Who's calling the shot? Who is the quarterback? It's the quarterback question. When you walked in, you were handed this playbook. We provided an outline for you. The first thing I would like for you to fill out is this, your quarterback. Your quarterback is either yourself or Christ. It's as simple as that. Your quarterback is either yourself or Jesus. Because remember, this, this rich guy with all this potential was like, Jesus, I mean, I've kept all the commandments. And here's what Jesus said, sell everything and give everything to the poor and follow me. Boom! By saying that, Jesus was saying, you're talking about you've kept all the commandments, the Decalogue? You just broke the first one, big boy. What's the first commandment? No other gods before me. He's broken that. And Jesus is saying, what? Really? No turnovers, no fumbles? You played perfectly, really? You perform perfectly, and in fact, Jesus does give us that option. If you're perfect as a player on the field of life, at the end of the hunt, when you clock out, when your time is up, when the horn sounds, Jesus will say, come on into heaven, you performed your way in. Hey dude, you're perfect. But you know, the Bible tells me that I have this condition the Bible tells me that God is holy, he's pure. I have this southward, downward pull that, that is, is, is called my sin nature. When I commit just one turnover, when I step out of bounds one time, when I don't run the route right one time, 
If I trip up one time, I cannot perform my way in. It's not through, through achievement. It's something I have to believe and receive. It's something that we don't deserve. You're the Lord's number one draft pick. You're number one draft pick. You are. Think about it. He scouted you, vetted you. He's seen how many times you can bench press 225. He knows your 40 time. Broad jump, vertical. And even though it's this or that or whatever, he loves you. You matter to him. You're his first round pick. And he's offered this contract because he sees the potential that's eternal, that is worth squillions of dollars. He's given you the Mont Blanc pen. And he said, okay, here's, here's where to sign, a little sticker, you know, the little arrow. He said, sign, sign up. I mean, I can't do it for you, just sign up. You see the law, going back to the law, why do we have the law? Well, well, well the law, obviously the 10 commandments, the Bacalog tells us how to live, but, but also the law shows us that we're dirty. The, the, the Bible calls the law a mirror. We look in the mirror, we look in the law, and we're like, whoa, I've, I've fallen short, you know what I'm saying? I, I've, I've, I've messed up. Well, the mirror does not clean us up, the law points us, what, to the supernatural love of God. God said, hey, I've taken care of it. I sent the ultimate quarterback to live righteously, to die sacrificially, to rise bodily, giving you an opportunity to make Jesus your quarterback. Who's your quarterback? It's cash? Who's your quarterback? Feelings? Who's your quarterback? Possessions, power, who's your quarterback? What happens when we make Jesus our quarterback? It's just simply lordship because Jesus has to be quarterback of all. If he's not quarterback of all, he's not quarterback at all. He can't just kind of be a quarterback. Yeah, Jesus is kind of my quarterback. He, he's, he's my quarterback when I'm in a tough situation. He's my, he's my quarterback when I need to meet that, 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 that girl. He's my, he's my quarterback before I go into the office and, and, and have that deal. He's, he's my quarterback then, but you know, when I watch television or the places I go and what I do alone, well, 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 I'll just, I'll just quarterback my own life. No, 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 he wants it all because he wants us to discover what it means to push the ball downfield. Well, what happens when we make Jesus our quarterback? Number one, fill the blank in, it's fun. Those blanks say, fill me in, fill me in, fill me in, right? Number one, we are a part of a great team. We are a part of a great team. And if you don't think 11 guys can change the world, think about the disciples. There were 12 disciples, Jesus cut Judas. <laughs> he quarterbacked the 11 and they changed the world, they changed the world with some serious offense. So we're a part of a great team. Isaiah says in Isaiah 61.10, for he's clothed us in the garments of salvation. He's covered me with the robe of righteousness. So when I, when I have this experience, when I have this exchange, when I sign on the dotted line, this incredible transaction takes place, all of my guilt for God's grace, all of my penalties for the person of Jesus, all of my wrongdoings for his righteousness. So now I have the robe of righteousness. I have a custom made NFL jersey. And then the Bible tells me in Ephesians chapter six, verse 11, put on the full armor of God. If you're gonna play in the NFL, you better have some gear on. And that's the true Under Armour, right? That's the real deal. So we gotta put it on. So, so Jesus clothes us in righteousness and then we gotta get dressed every day for the game. Are you a part of God's team? He wants you to be. I think one of the reasons we have a desire to become team members of certain things or fans, I think it's, a, it's just a microcosm of a greater desire to be a part of the team of the Lord. So, so we're a part of a team. Number two, notice this, the quarterback question. When I make Jesus my quarterback, we play our position. Isn't it terrible when you're out of position? One of my first jobs I ever had, this is horrible. I'll break out in a cold sweat telling you this. I worked in the accounting department of a travel agency. 
I am the worst mathematician ever. Algebra two, I failed it, had to take it again. And my younger brother was in the same class as I was. I'm a senior in high school. He's like a freshman or something, embarrassing. And I'm working in an office. What? Accounting? I remember thinking, this is horrible. I hate it. I was out of position. Do you feel like you're out of position right now? You're like, damn, sit. Oh man, I'm just out of position. I don't know. I, uh, Omaha, Omaha. I, I, just, I just don't feel right. I, I don't, I don't, I don't. Well, if you're out of position, if you don't feel right, I'm telling you, you got the wrong quarterback. You got the wrong quarterback. Who's quarterback in your life? So we have to play our position. James 1.22 says, don't listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. The Lord has a position for you. And there's peace in the position. But you're not gonna discover your position, nor will I, until we make Jesus the quarterback, listen to him, submit our lives to him. You see, that's, that's one of the major issues that we deal with, authority issues. You know, you know authority issues. Authority is everywhere. God's a God of authority. Can you imagine the Cowboys huddling up, Tony calling a play, and everybody gets in a big honking fight in the huddle because they don't agree with what he's saying. That, 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 that would be dumb. They have to submit their gifts and their abilities to the game plan, to the play. This is our playbook. God's ways are higher than our ways. The coach's ways are higher than the player's ways. They see things from a different perspective. So you've got to submit. So in culture, students, submit to the authority of your mom and dad. Submit to the authority of that coach, that teacher. Well, I don't respect them, man. Good. You might not respect them. Respect the position. Do you think every player respects the quarterback in the NFL? No. They respect the position. You don't understand everything Jesus tells you to do. We will not understand every pattern. We'll not understand every formation. We've got to trust him. Who's your quarterback? Who's your quarterback? So we're part of a great team. We play our position, number three. We understand the game plan. And Jesus said in John 10, 27, my sheep hear my voice. Isn't it crazy about being a parent? You can just recognize your kids' voices. Crowd be going crazy. Ah! Woo! Ah! That's my son. Ah! That's my daughter. <laughs> Romo comes up, checks out the defense, and the devil's trying to knock our head off. You know that. He's playing for keeps. He wants to take you out and me out. He's got a strategy to mess up your life, a strategy to mess up your marriage, a strategy to mess up your kids, a strategy to ruin your future. But Jesus is our quarterback. He's looking around. He's reading the defense. He's changing the play. He's audibilizing. We better listen and know the snap count We better watch his cues because he has our best interests in mind. We understand his game plan, and the game plan for life is this. Lisa and I did a relationship seminar in Virginia over the last couple of days. As I was flying home yesterday before the service, I thought to myself, wow, Ed, all you did was you just simply gave everyone God's strategy for relationships. I just simply said, okay, here's God's game plan. Jesus wants to quarterback your dating relationship, your marriage, your family, and here's what he wants you to do, here's what he wants me to do. So I'm just simply saying, here is the game plan, but it starts, again, with the quarterback. And the last thing I wanna tell you, and this is good, this is good. Yep, we're part of a great team. Yes, we play our position, yes, the game plan, but the fourth thing is, 
we will win. We will win. We're going to win. So, are you really playing recreational football? Are you really trying to quarterback your own team? You got Tony Romo? And, and he's playing center? Really? Really? It's not going to work. You do okay. It's not going to work. God wants us to win. It's not easy. God wants us to win. We got to put our under armor on. God wants us to win. We need to be a part of his team, playing his position, following his game plan, and we will win. We'll push the ball downfield and we'll discover what our lives are all about. And it's the quarterback question. Let's bow our heads. Father, our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. Whether you're here, you're in the balcony, whether you're at our campus in Fort Worth, one of the overflow rooms, whether you're in Miami, whether you're watching online, whether you find yourself on the continent of Africa, the Middle East, if you find yourself in London, wherever you are, some here need to, to, to say, Lord Jesus, I make you my quarterback. You take control of every area of my life. Just, just, just say that, that can be your prayer. Others here, others here, as you, as you look around, you're like, man, I, I haven't thought about this, this great game plan God has for me. I haven't thought about getting into his strategy, his playbook. It's time to make that decision. Because over the next couple of weeks, I want you to commit to attending here. Don't be like the rich young ruler and bolt off the fields. Hang in here. Hang around Jesus. Hang around his church. And I'm telling you, life change will happen. We ask all these things in Christ's name. Amen.